so Dr. Yaari was far too modest. That was his normal brain on MRI. <laughs> okay. So my job now, and I realize some of you will have to leave at 1 o'clock, understand most of these presentations are 45 minutes to an hour in and of themselves. So we're really compressing and talking fast. So if you have to leave, feel free. Um, my job now is to take us beyond the diagnosis and to help us understand what are the changes that we see in the course of the disease and what are the implications as different kinds of clinicians, what are the things that we want to pay attention to. So when we're looking at early Alzheimer's disease, as uh, Dr. Yaari said, we're seeing gradual changes in memory, thinking, and function. There's no clear beginning. Um, the early stage might be gradually over two to four years. So if I ask the history, I will hear something like, you know, we're not really sure, but as we think back, it was maybe two or three years ago that we noted forgetfulness. An important thing in the early stages is somebody comes to you in a clinical practice or in a clinical setting of any kind and says, I'm concerned about my memory. Sit up and take notice and maybe do a screening and pay attention to it. Um, because it's really easy for these people to compensate still for uh, weakness. So they may talk around the word if they're having word finding difficulty. You may see more word substitutions, um, more struggling for a word. Um, but they can compensate and so people will tend to brush them off and say they're not having a problem. Uh, but it's that same um, kind of being more self-conscious about the difficulties they're having with their language that can make them begin to withdraw from social um, interactions. And that's one of the warning signs we see in early stage um, is withdrawal from social activities and activities in general that they used to have interest in. Um, the language can become simpler. Um, you may notice that conversations are more superficial. Um, beginning to lose and misplacing things more and, and decreasing time awareness. So if somebody is missing appointments all of a sudden where they have been, um, keeping track of them might be a little bit of a risk factor. Um, hearing a history of starting to get lost or, oh my gosh, I went to the wrong place for the appointment. We hear this a lot. They go, they have appointments in different buildings, but they look the same. The complexes look the same. So they go looking for their primary care practice and they're actually at a different setting. Um, they may tell you that they're not comfortable driving that it's harder for them to imagine the route or they're using uh, the computer and they're printing out directions for how to get to places they used to drive to automatically. Um, the forgetfulness can include family events, keeping track of, again, those time orientations, birthdays, anniversaries. After a, a period of time, lists may not make sense for them anymore, so where they've been able to compensate by writing notes on things they want to remember, they have trouble with it. And then as you heard Dr. Yari say, uh, mood or behavioral changes can happen. Depression is a risk factor and depression is also a predictive factor, as is delirium. Um, so what are the concerns in the early stage? And generally when we're looking at saying somebody is in early stage, if we were to do it straight by test scores, we would be saying somebody 20 and above on the mini mental. Okay, and between 10 to 20 we would say would be in the moderate stage and below 10 would be in the later severe stage. The things I want everybody to be aware of, uh, medication management. So as I have more trouble keeping track of date and time and I have less awareness of what's going on with me, I may not remember that I have high blood pressure, that I have high um, cholesterol and that I have diabetes and that I take medications for that. I may be very routinized with my medication. So I know I take five pills, but now you're giving me something new. Guess what? I'm going to take that pill out and I'm going to put it over here. Um, I may look at the pill box and think it's Tuesday, but see Monday pills have not been taken. So what am I going to do? I'm going to duplicate. I'm going to take all of the pills at once. So the potential for error is great. So if you see somebody who all of a sudden has labile blood um, pressure, labile um, blood glucose levels, 
you may want to just kind of raise the red flag. Are they taking their medications appropriately? Driving uh, needs to be an ongoing discussion in aging in general, but particularly when we see memory issues uh, because of the changes in visual spatial uh, perceptual skills, the uh, changes in reflexes and in judgment. Weight loss can be indicative of mood features that are being untreated, can be indicative of side effects to the very medications that we're putting on board for cognition, can be indicative of somebody living alone and not remembering to feed themselves, and can be indicative of somebody who is being left alone and to a certain point was remembering to fix breakfast for themselves and now they're not and so they're missing a key number of calories every day. Mood, we already talked about depression, that's uh, both a risk and predictive factor, but you can also see increasing anxiety. Uh, depression often manifests in early stage on through as anger and irritability. So just because somebody denies depression doesn't mean that they aren't showing us signs that there are depression. Um, anxiety starts to come out as they're less uh, comfortable being alone. They will often start making more calls to family. Um, sometimes we get calls to our office. Our uh, concern in the early stage is just to overall quality of life. Um, so if somebody is withdrawing from activities, um, tending to isolate themselves, maybe have some shame associated with the diagnosis, and again isolating which just reinforces all of the above concerns. Uh, we have somebody who is overall becoming more and more a vulnerable adult, changing judgment and reasoning. They're more prone to exploitation by um, people in the community and even by their own family members. Uh, so adult protective services may need to be called. Autonomy, we walk a fine line in the early stage because these are people who can still live alone but are going to have uh, changes over time and we're going to need to put in more gradual supervision and then uh, gradual assistance. So sometimes when we have behavioral issues we need to back off a little bit because sometimes when the diagnosis is made the family immediately steps in and puts everything into place. And I think the one thing that Dr. Yaari and I would both agree is that it doesn't matter how far along we get in the process and how impaired language is, at some level our patients are able to tell us, I don't feel like I have anything left to contribute. Okay. A real concern we're seeing more and more of, um, in our practices, who's taking care of whom, right? There's the hidden victim, the, the rest of the family, particularly the caregiver, but we have an aging population and that same spouse may be developing memory symptoms as well and that becomes a logistical nightmare uh, need to involve uh, the family. And the last thing in, in the early stages um, is just the proactive planning. We need to make sure that we have all things like advanced care directives done, the health care proxy, mental health care power of attorney, financial power of attorney. Living Will is a copy of that on file. Um, has a copy been uh, passed on to the family? Has the family met with an elder law attorney to know what the finances and the estate planning might be because there are going to be costs associated as we move through uh, the disease process. When we move into the middle stage of Alzheimer's disease, this is often where people will call and say there's a dramatic decline and really what's happened is they're not able to compensate. They cannot cover up for their weaknesses. The ability to do um, instrumental activities of daily living or complex tasks, multitasking falls off. Uh, their ability to use technology falls off. So can't use the microwave, get confused with the settings on the washer and the dryer. Um, stop using the answer machine, won't answer the phone, um, can't use the phone to make phone calls and then last um, often is the TV remote. 
uh, can't be used. And then as we progress through um, the moderate stage of Alzheimer's disease, so roughly about the time on the mini mental that you would see a score of maybe 15 or 16, we see a change in their ability to make decisions functionally out in the community. They can't choose from a menu at home. They're not making choices and changing their clothing every day. They're not dressing appropriately for the weather. They're dressing for the environment they're in. So if the air conditioning is on, they feel cold, they're going to dress for the cold and they'll tend to layer clothes. They'll tend to wear the same clothes day after day and then become more and more resistive to um, bathing or showering. And that's where we often begin to see significant behavioral disturbances as we have to step in and start to help with um, personal care. That's an invasion of my private space and um, dignity, and that's where we often see aggression. Judgment and problem solving really becomes um, an issue. This is where we speak to the um, issue of um, a time that we speak to the issue of capacity. So they cannot make good decisions for themselves because they cannot follow a whole line of thought that if I made this choice, it could have this effect and each effect might have a secondary concern. They get lost on the details, so they cannot make financial decisions. They cannot make medical decisions for themselves. Uh, they're much more concrete in their thinking. Um, this is one in a question I want you to ask people routinely is, if there was an emergency at your house, what would you do? Early stage, I'll hear, well, I'd, I'd use the phone, I'd make sure people are out of the house, um, and I'll call 911. And as it begins to transition, you go, well, I would just make a phone call, but, but who would you need to call? Well, the numbers are posted over the, the desk, but, but what number do you use in your community? Um, or how could you get help? I want to tell you that somebody in moderate stage who has a plan to call their son in Chicago for help is not able to be alone. And that's the real concern in moderate stage. Because of changing judgment and reasoning and more and more difficulties with language, all made worse when under stress, they cannot take care of themselves in the event of an emergency. And yet we have people who are continuing to live alone and be left alone for significant um, periods of time. Uh, they can become more anxious, not remember that you say you're going to the store. They don't have the time awareness. You're gone 15 minutes, feels like a week to them. They're going to leave the house looking for you. Those are the safety concerns. Um, and again, that can all um, increase dependence because they're needing more and more help for just personal care that then um, increases the burden on the caregiver. So what are the issues that we pay attention to? Well, obviously behaviors, and I've li listed just a few of the 20 plus behaviors. Uh, suspiciousness, paranoia, the irritability, uh, loss of impulse control. They're becoming more childlike in their understanding of the world and in their um, repertoire of tools to use to function in the course of the day. Um, so it's not unusual to, and I'm always checking, what happens if you pull into a parking spot? Do they wait and get out of the car with you, or do they bolt from the car? Because when they bolt, they're like a child, right? How many times in the parking lot do you see that young child bolt, and you say, no, stop? Stop because they're not paying attention to traffic. These same wanderers have left assisted living facilities and been found on the 51 wandering. They're less attuned to environmental stimuli and understanding what that um, means to them. Um, hallucinations, visual or auditory, so the man in our waiting room, look at this beautiful blue flower. That's the hallucination I'm showing you. More common in our population is a misperception. So I look at something, but I call it something else. So how many of you at night have had the experience of driving down the road, you're a little tired, and you're convinced there's a black bear along the roadside, and you get there and it's a tree trunk, or you, you think you see an animal off in the side. That's a misperception. Um, the issue uh, with the caregiver and even as 
providers is that this is somebody who is having progressive loss of language. And language is the ability to understand, the ability to speak, the ability to read, and the ability to write. All of these are being lost. And so we need to pay attention to the fact that we can't give them four-step directions anymore. We need to bring it down to two. We need to bring it to one. We may say, are you feeling depressed? And they look at you. I don't know what you mean. You may have to rephrase the question. You may need to keep it simple. You need to realize that it's stressful to be asked questions. Um, playing 20 questions is the worst thing with them. Um, so sometimes you just need to create rapport. It takes a little longer. You need to make sure that they feel safe and um, that it's a comfortable environment for them. You may need to resort to gestures, sort of more, you know, does it hurt anything here? Do you feel anything here? Uh, the caregiver stress, this is where we worry about their own emotional and physical well-being. Uh, the caregiver is the one who's liable to go first because of the uh, cumulative effects of stress. I already talked about the fact that this is when they need 24-7 supervision. And an issue during this time becomes whether to place or not. It's uh, no right or wrong. Placement can absolutely be successfully done. Um, it's a discussion with family in terms of what are their values, what are their personal values, what are the um, financial means, what are the physical and emotional means by which they can support somebody staying at home or placing. Late to end stage Alzheimer's. Um, so this is somebody now who cannot bathe themselves, needs help with dressing, um, has evolved through a phase where we've needed to cut food for them. Um, and um, may not recognize the utensil now because of changing visual perceptual skills, may even overreach for utensils, may use utensils inappropriately. They don't recognize items for what they are. They have more trouble recognizing themselves um, compared to other people, may look at that and say, oh, I wonder whose foot that is. Um, we test sometimes for apraxia. Done. So one of the things we do is ask people to do this and then this. And the person in the later stage will try and wrap their fingers around my fingers as I do it. So harder um, separating facts from fiction. Their long-term memory is uh, affected, so they don't recognize their house as home. More confusion with who their caregivers are. May call them mom or dad, grandma. Um, I have one daughter who is just referred to as the nice lady who runs a very nice hotel. And that's where I live, is in her hotel. Um, and the real marker generally for this stage is uh, bowel and bladder incontinence. And then that transition from late moderate stage on is where we see the more hallmark signs of uh, later stage Alzheimer's disease, where we begin to see the stooped posture the forward head, the neck retraction, um, the more stooped, shuffling gait, no visual scanning. So what are the risks here? This is where we really, really, really begin to worry about risk for falls, and I would say even a little bit earlier. Um, so this is where you want to make sure um, in that transition with dressing and bathing on uh, that you've had physical and therapy uh, consults. Uh, they may be prone to infection or skin breakdown. They're less and less mobile, sitting longer and longer periods of time, partly because their uh, periods of concentration, um, alert awake cycles are changing and they're moving again more towards that young child where it's a greater period of the day that they're asleep um, and short periods that they're awake. So with that, they're not changing position as well and so you're going to get the skin breakdown. Coupled with that in the late to end stage may be the fact that they're not um, holding on to nutritional value from the food. They're not eating as much. We know there can be a change in food preferences. They may have troubles uh, chewing and swallowing food, uh, risk for um, aspiration, aspiration pneumonia, repeated um, ER visits um, enters into the equation. 
uh, weight loss that, that is truly a failure to thrive um, is the biggest indicator really for um, approaching end stage and uh, one of the markers we use to refer to hospice. Um, this is where we want to, when we're looking at things like dysphagia, working with the speech therapist, working with the nutritionist, how can we maintain high caloric intake and, and uh, reduce the potential for failure to thrive. With changing neurologic status, there's the potential for seizures. Um, sometimes they develop just myoclonic jerks that may or may not be um, interpreted as seizures. Um, and really, at this point, we as a medical community, regardless of what field we're in, we need to be comfortable initiating the dialogue that this is now planning for death and make sure that we get the hospice referrals on board. Uh, they tend to come way too late, um, often within two hours to two days before death, when we could have, in fact, had benefit of six months to even a year sometimes of transition, making sure that there is comfort and dignity. During this time and anywhere in the course of uh, treatment of Alzheimer's disease, any serious illness and or hospitalization will always produce a rapid decline. Um, it's disorienting to be in the hospital and uh, we try and keep them out of there. So preventative health maintenance. Is, is the name of the game. And that's why we want PTOT earlier rather than later so that we reduce the risk for falls. Uh, we want to make sure that they have all of their routine um, health care, flu shots, uh, dental care, uh, transition to electric toothbrush as they're less able to um, brush their teeth. Behaviors, just in summary, they're unmet needs. So think of a young child who is distraught. What goes through your head? Are they hungry? Are they tired? Are they uncomfortable? Um, do they need a, a diaper change? Do they need to toilet? Are they bored? Um, are they overstimulated? That's really what's going on and fatigue, literally brain fatigue and body fatigue in the course of the day is what contributes to the sundowning phenomenon that you heard about earlier. They're less able to cope with changes in environment and routine. So predictability, um, constancy of care providers, of structure in the environment is really what gets them through. Um, unfortunately, behaviors can often be personalized. So if I'm being accused of trying to hurt someone, um, that can hit really, really hard and, and create uh, resentment on the part of the care provider unless we're helping them understand what's going on. There's a lot that we can do to modify behavior simply by um, adhering to the usual rules of behavioral modification. Change your com uh, communication, your approach, or change things in the environment. If that isn't working, then we look at the um, medications. So um, the main thing with behaviors is the person cannot change. It's the brain that's changing on them. They cannot. We have to do it. And we'll go through there. So we go through um, weight loss. One of the big things: make sure that we're not overzealous with dietary management for diabetes. We're talking end stage. Do we really need to get those BGs under 120, or can we liberalize the diet? Uh, make sure that we do things like provide socialization, um, sleep you heard about with good sleep hygiene, and we talked about that. And the last part is just to make sure that you address the caregivers as you're meeting with anybody, always touching base with where their mood is, um, where their own resilience is. Make sure that um, you're not hearing a pattern of such frustration and fatigue that they're becoming unwitting abusers. And we'll close it there and open it up. I leave you with this quote, uh, memory is the cabinet of imagination, the treasury of reason, the registry of conscience, the council chamber of thought. And that's really all of the things that we see affected over time with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so whether from the campus or no, they're sending emails, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, Thank you. If you guys wouldn't mind both coming up and then we can, uh, why don't you both come up and then we can, we'll go back and forth. We'll start with taking questions here. Uh, if you have to leave, please do so. Yeah.
quietly and non-disruptively. Thank you all for coming. Um, if you ha and we'll take the first question here, and then we'll take one from Kirksville if you guys have any. Any questions here in the audience in Phoenix? Mesa. My uh, my father actually he was just uh, diagnosed with dementia, and uh, he's now in a care facility. He needs 24-hour maintenance, and you're talking um, a lot about end of life, and that's something that I didn't not expecting. And I was wondering what the average is once you're diagnosed with dementia and, and those type of things. Um, how long? Average um, from time of diagnosis. Uh, might be eight to ten years um, if you're looking at the full bell curve, two to twenty, um, depending on where in the process you're diagnosed. It's very variable, person to person, and any one person you can't predict. And you just try to see how things have been going up to this point, and maybe extrapolate that curve, and that's the best we could do uh, as far as prediction goes. I, I don't even try to predict. I get asked that question a lot. And what I like to tell people is that I didn't go to Hogwarts Medical School. That being said, do we know uh, predictors of when the end is more in sight in Alzheimer's? It's when I see that failure to thrive. It's when I hear a picture of starting to pouch food um, or putting food in the mouth no longer. Um, it uses a uh, chewing response. Uh, somebody who has become um, potentially wheelchair bound or having difficulty and is fully dependent for all aspects of their care. They participate in the level that I know where it could um, end. Okay, we've got a question from Kirksville. I have a friend whose father is severely handicapped by Alzheimer's. She has been told that the genetic aspect is very strong and she is now almost convinced she is destined to develop the condition. How accurate is this? What can I tell her? So uh, this is a question that uh, family members will ask frequently. And, and the data I have is uh, for Alzheimer's disease, dementia, uh, there is a genetic component. Uh, the studies have shown that if a person has one first degree relative with Alzheimer's disease, so either one parent or one sibling with Alzheimer's disease, then their risk is three times greater uh, than somebody without that family history. If there's a family history of two first degree relatives with Alzheimer's disease, then that person has a risk of it's about seven times greater. There are some genes uh, that could be associated with Alzheimer's disease. For the regular late, uh, what's called that, late Alzheimer's disease, which is uh, onset over the age of 65 with exceptions, uh, which is about 99 plus percent of the cases of Alzheimer's disease, there's a gene called the apolipoprotein E4 gene, ApoE4. Uh, so that's a risk factor gene. Uh, if somebody carries one copy of that gene, then their risk of developing Alzheimer's is greater than somebody without that gene, about three times greater. If somebody is homozygous or carries two copies of the ApoE4 gene, then their risk is actually a lot higher, about 11, 9 to 11 times higher. Just because somebody has the ApoE4 gene does not mean that they will develop Alzheimer's disease. And you cannot have that gene and still develop Alzheimer's. About half the people with Alzheimer's disease or more do not have an ApoE4 gene. It's a risk factor gene. In my clinical practice, I do not routinely genetically test. And um, uh, what I counsel the children on is that there's nothing that we know about that we can do right now that can prevent Alzheimer's to so live a healthy, happy lifestyle, physically active. This is what I tell my patients, too, and their families. Be physically active, socially active, and mentally active. Um, and I pretty much leave it at that. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, our, our counsel is that we don't do the genotyping because a lot of adult children do come to us and say, is this something I need to know? But when the information is not specific enough, 
and all it does is identify a risk factor. What are you going to do with the information? So you can be the sad sack Eeyore sort who just says, oh well, you know, I have a risk for Alzheimer's um, and choose to kind of be doom and gloom for the rest of their lives as opposed to the other one who says, I have a risk factor, that's all it is. I can take control in terms of doing all the heart healthy heart healthy translating as brain healthy things and, and maintaining a, a good level of physical activity, social and spiritual connection, and um, stimulating my brain, learning, be about learning new things. Can we take another question here, Mesa? I know you said it was a whole other topic on its own, but do you have any advice for, say, a primary care provider um, in evaluating a patient's fitness for driving? I know there's resources like refresher courses at the MBD and you know occupational therapy, uh, even referral for neuropsychiatric evaluation. What what have you found to be the best approach for a PCP? Yeah, so I could tell you how I do it. And I, I don't know if the way I do it would be the best approach for a PCP. I haven't actually thought about that much, but maybe you could tell me. Um, and I'm speaking in the context of dementia only. Like I'm not talking about other issues that could impair driving. So if I have a patient with dementia, what am I looking at? One thing I'm listening for is on the clinical history. And this is in private. When I collect the history, when the history is collected from the family, when the patient is not present, how is their driving? It's a question we ask everybody if they're still driving. Are they still driving? If so, what's it like? Are there unexplained scratches or dings in the car? Have there been recent citations? Have they been getting lost? Uh, all the car questions, what's their judgment, etc. If the family reports that driving is impaired, that is generally a very good indicator that driving is impaired. Um, you might not always get an accurate history from family. And, and one thing to be careful of, this is also a parenthetical, is if you do stop somebody's driving based on what the family says, don't tell the patient, I'm stopping the driving because your family told me your driving is bad. Uh, blame it on something else. And what I usually do is I blame it on the cognitive tests. I say, oh, you scored below whatever is in this test. I studies show you can't drive anymore. Whether that's true or not, uh, we get the patient to stop. Uh, so I listen to what the family says. And then, then I do look at the visual spatial tasks and some of the cognitive tests we do. Uh, that first line, the upper line on the MOCA, which had that executive functioning task where you have to alternate between 1A, 2B, is a nice test. Uh, the clock drawing task, and then the cube copy. Uh, those send off red flags. You could be impaired in those and still be a good driver. So when I'm seeing a patient in clinic, I'm, I, I kind of fit them in one of three categories. Either uh, I don't have any red flags, meaning the family says they're a good driver and I see no red flags in the cognitive tests. Uh, they would fall in the category of must stop driving, which means family says that they're a poor driver and the cognitive tests corroborate. And the third would be uncertain. Either the family says they're a good driver and the neurocog tests show that visual spatial is significantly impaired or executive is impaired, or uh, vice versa. The cognitive check tests are stellar and the family is saying, I oh, you know, we're a little bit worried. So if they fall into that uncertain category, uh, what I really like to do, and not everybody can afford it, um, but uh, I actually strongly advise uh, for patients to get a formal driving test. And uh, here in Phoenix, in the greater Phoenix area, there are at least three, four places that I know about that do, they're private institutions that do a formal on-road driving test or a simulator. And I tell people, uh, if you pass that test, then you can drive. Uh, and uh, for six to 12 months, depending on what's going on, we'll need to repeat it. Uh, many patients are very reluctant, very common reaction. I've been driving for 35 years, never been in an accident, nobody can tell me I need to stop driving, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you probably may have heard that. If, uh, so a very common reaction, and the way I try to counsel people is I tell them about the safety issues. Hey, you could be a threat to yourself. You could be a threat to other people out in the road. So this is a public safety issue. When that doesn't work, I talk about the financial issues. If, God forbid, you're in a car accident, whether it's your fault or not, you're driving with dementia, you could get sued and they could take everything. And if the ethical issues don't speak to them, then the litigation issues do. And usually at that point, they agree to get a formal driving test. Uh, and that's my general approach in a nutshell. 
that being said, there are some things too um, that we do in addition. So one in that transition or we know um, that driving is going to have to be given up. One regular monitoring by family. Somebody has to ride in the car. Be aware of secondary gains. So, um, oh yeah, he drives just fine as long as I tell him where to go. Well, guess what? She's legally blind, has multiple health issues, but he's the one with dementia. Does it behoove her to say he's doing just fine? Sure, but, but she can't see. Um, or we always kind of use the mantra, if you wouldn't let your grandchildren be transported by grandma or grandpa, it's time to stop driving, except I have one daughter who it it helps that grandpa can drive the kids to school, although daughter refuses to ride with him. So we have to be careful. Driving needs to be an ongoing discussion. The worst thing of all is to be blindsided, like, boom, I've been driving him today, you tell me I can't drive. It needs to be an ongoing discussion. And in geriatrics, right, we see um, physical disabilities. We, we see less of an ability to scan the environment because of stenosis, arthritis, visual or sensory uh, changes in general. So we should be addressing it regularly. And um, if we know that we're getting close to that point, it's also good for families to start putting in adaptive strategies. So gosh darn, every time I come home, my car is in your way, Dad. Why don't we take mine and we'll go out to eat? So they get used to driving with somebody else. That way it's not quite a blow. And then the other is to say, we're going to make sure that your life does not stop when driving is given up. Because it's a huge loss of independence. Um, can really plummet the mood, um, even if they don't go anywhere. Um, so knowing what are the what are the alternatives for a while? Can they use the bus to independence? Can they use the Medicare cab or Medicaid cab? Um, can we put a volunteer circle in, or do we hire a, a home visitation kind of person? And getting people to stop driving if they should stop driving and they refuse to stop driving. Well, that's a topic for another time. Yeah. Bring me back. <laughs> All right, another question from Kirksville. How important is regular social interaction for someone who has been uh, who has Alzheimer's diagnosis? And define regular. We're never 24-7 dependent on anybody. But all of a sudden, a caregiver is in a position of having to be with somebody 24-7. Right? Let's look at most married couples. If you look in a restaurant, can you pick them out, those who have been married 40 to 50 to 60 years? Nice lights. Right? It's hard to be 24-7 stimulation to anybody. And there's a different way of being with friends and other family, and they bring out different parts of the brain that might still be intact. So regular social activity should be on a daily basis. Um, and it can be family, it can be friends, and we encourage it to be with numbers of other people. A lot of people will say, oh, no, 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 it never was a social butterfly. Don't have to be a social butterfly, but you were still about connection. And sitting in the computer and playing solitaire all day long does not stimulate the brain nor boost the, um, the spirits, the same as being with people where you don't know where the conversation's going to go and if you're with people who make it safe for you to talk and interact, it can highlight parts of the brain that are very active, so regular, daily. Questions here? Going once? Another question of Crookshow down here. Yeah, there's a All right, uh, another question from Kirksville. My father might not pass the safety telephone test, but I am certain he would not meet admission criteria for an Alzheimer's unit. Are you suggesting round the clock in home care?
So 24-7 means that somebody needs to be there to help them get through the day and monitor situations where there might be um, safety issues. That can come from uh, creative problem solving with the family. So I will always say, all right, as we need to put more assistance and supervision in place, let's look at the path of least resistance. Let's sit down and have a family conference. Who's available? Who has what time and what talent to bring to the equation? Um, the next might be, how about in the friend circle? Is there a new Near and dear trusted friend we can tap into who can come and spend some time. Faith community. Faith is all about mission. Who can we tap into in the faith community who might bring meals and spend some time sitting and talking? Who might have some background that would allow them to help with activities of daily living? Beyond that, you then look at um, home care agencies and bringing them on board initially as friendly companions and visitors, and then somebody who can help with personal and household related care. By the time if you have have somebody you're paying 24-7, that's pretty expensive and that's not what most people have um, financial capabilities for. Somewhere around 10 hours a day of in-home care is a breaking point in which it becomes cheaper to live in a dementia care unit. But they, if you have the resources and can keep them at home, absolutely. All right, great. Here's another question from Kirksdale. Which healthcare professionals are likely to administer the MMSE clock test or MOCA? Uh, in general, uh, I think neurologists uh, will do a mini or a clock test. The MOCA is relatively new and is gaining steam, so uh, not many people are very familiar with the MOCA or comfortable with it yet, uh, but it is gaining steam. Geriatric psychiatrists uh, will also uh, generally be well-versed uh, in these tests, and um, a lot of primary care docs are. A lot of primary care docs are very familiar with the MINI, and we'll use the MINI in conjunction with the clock. Uh, there's something called the MINI COG, which uh, people, uh, primary care docs in a very busy practice use, which is a three-word list uh, recall and uh, a clock drawing task, uh, which is a, a decent screen, but not perfect. But to answer the question, uh, in general, neurologists, geriatric psychiat psychiatrists, geriatricians, and um, I, I think a, a lot of primary care docs as well. Nurses um, are using it out in the community. Nurses are doing it out in the community. Um, therapists with cognitive training, speech language might use the mini, um, maybe not be as familiar with the MOCA. Um, it isn't that you can't be trained to do it, but in the context of helping establish a diagnosis, exactly as he said. And the, the doctor doesn't have to do the mini. Uh, if, if in busy practice, you could train a staff member to do it, and while the patient you know, is waiting, just pull them in and have a staff member do the mini uh, be, before you, you walk in. Uh, so it's not something that the doctor necessarily needs to do, or the PA or the MP. Does Medicare cover the tests, cover the costs of the tests needed to diagnose and rule out the possibilities? Yes. Uh, um, I was just going to add that most occupational therapists would know how to do those tests. So, um, um, yeah, I would love for you guys to talk a little bit about um, the role of occupational therapy. therapy um, in, the, in the middle stage is absolutely where I see um, a lot of referrals. We do PTOT referrals as they're having changes in ADL function. How can we um, simplify the tasks? Um, how can we reduce falls looking at the home in terms of uh, safety and maximizing function, um, addressing all of those kinds of things. It's plus minus whether you really affect visual perceptual skills. I know that's um, something that uh, occupational therapists are well trained in. Um, but you have a brain that is in a neurodegenerative process as opposed to a plastic uh, newborn brain where they're um, changing. So uh, there are those who try to do um, some cognitive training, um, speech therapists and occupational therapists in the early stage might be have um, some effect, but it's nothing that's held. And uh, occupational therapists uh, for patients who have apraxia. Apraxia is when 
uh, the communication between the brain and the limb is disconnected and there may be a hard time using utensils uh, or other um, implements that are used in daily functioning, occupational therapists can often uh, be quite useful uh, in adaptive techniques for those patients. There's actually a, a more rare type of dementia called cortical basal ganglionic degeneration where that can be common. Okay, um, money for re how is money for research in the Alzheimer's dementia area compared to that for uh, heart research or cancer research? And how can money uh, for research be increased? I don't know if I can answer that question uh, fully. I know that um, there's been a hit uh, due to the economy and uh, a lot of uh, pharmac uh, pharmacy companies, pharmaceutical companies are actually uh, decreasing the amount of attention they're providing to Alzheimer's disease currently, uh, but we'll see when the economy resumes. Uh, there's still a lot going on in terms of clinical trial from the private pharma world, uh, and as far as uh, grants go, um, I think the tap has been turned down a little bit. Um, there is an initiative called the Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative, uh, which is uh, gaining a lot of steam, and I believe that they're doing pretty well. A, a lot of philanthropy. Uh, philanthropy is stepping up uh, for for uh, research for Alzheimer's as well. I don't know if you know more about that than I do. Yeah. But yes, money helps. <laughs> All right, just a couple more here from Kurtzville. Um, in October of 2010, a lot of press was given to results of a multi-centered clinical trial, I believe University of Pennsylvania among others, using Cibrio spinal fluid benchmarks to diagnose Alzheimer's. Please comment. Yeah, so I mentioned that briefly in the talk. So there are, um, you could look in the spinal fluid for amyloid and tau and the ratio between the two. Uh, amyloid actually goes down and tau goes up. They're proteins that we see affected in the pathology of Alzheimer's disease and it's run through Athena Diagnostics. I heard recently that Medicare may be covering it, but uh, that, that's a recent development. It's been out of, an out-of-pocket expense, which is why we don't do it too much. And uh, the specificity and sensitivity for that is not great. It's in the ballpark of 85% sensitive and specific uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And as far as the other dementias, um, it's useful in ruling out Alzheimer's disease for the most part, or ruling in Alzheimer's disease. It's a test. Uh, that will probably gain more steam over time as we know more about it, uh, but and if it is covered by Medicare, uh, but for the time being, where at least it hasn't been covered uh, recently, and uh, it's still not a perfect test, I generally reserve it for patients that are ambiguous, where I really am not sure what's going on, and I need more information. In my clinic patients, I would say I probably do a spinal tap maybe once or twice a year, not very common at all for this test, for Alzheimer's. There's another entity called normal pressure hydrocephalus where we might do spinal taps. That may be off topic. Uh, but for research, almost all research studies that we have at the current time test the spinal fluid and use it as a biological marker uh, to see how the medications are affecting the amyloid in the fluid and other potential biomarkers to be learned about in the future. So mainly still in the realm of research, used clinically, uh, in my opinion, for clinically ambiguous cases when you need more information. But that could change as time goes on. All right, two more. Would you have to dissect the brain to be sure that a patient had Alzheimer's? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, they, they've done the studies, and doctors like myself uh, who've been trained in the field when we make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, we're right 90% of the time. Well, that means we're wrong 10% of the time. And uh, they know that because of those pathological studies on autopsy. Not biopsy, but autopsy. Um, so in the 10% of the time when we're wrong, it's generally a different type of dementia. Okay, so maybe it's a Lewy body or a subset of frontotemporal dementia. So yes, for the time being, uh, you, if you want to make a 100% definitive diagnosis, you need to look at the pathology. And if you talk to the pathologists, they'll even tell you that's not 100% definitive because there, there's a lot of subjectivity in that, uh, or some subjectivity in that as well. Uh, hopefully the diagnostic tools will get better uh, over time, and I think we're getting closer to that. 
uh, but for the time being that's uh, still a true statement, but we're getting better. And there are a lot of studies where we're following people over time uh, to look at these biological markers, and they're getting better with the PET scan imaging, uh, with uh, assessing brain volumes over time, with the CSF testing. I might be missing something. Uh, Oh, yeah, right, and we can measure the plaques now. I mentioned earlier we can actually see the amyloid in FTG PET. That's up and coming stuff, so hopefully we'll get better. All right, and the last question, is dementia before Alzheimer's? So uh, dementia is a descriptive term. Uh, dementia is sort of an umbrella term. It gives the description. This is a person who's had a change in function over time because of some kind of change within the brain. The term dementia by itself doesn't say what is the cause of that dementia. There are many different types of dementia, or diseases that could affect the brain to cause a dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. There are other dementias, like frontal temporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, and et cetera, et cetera. Whenever I see a patient in clinic, what I'm trying to figure out, is there a dementia present? Yes or no? And if there is a dementia present, what is the cause of that dementia? Is it due to Alzheimer's or is it due to one of the others or a combination of factors? The clinical criteria for dementia is an impairment in day-to-day -day functioning uh, due to some process, but it doesn't say what that process is. So the term dementia, again, a descriptive word, an, an umbrella term. There are many different types or causes for dementia. Alzheimer's type dementia is a cause of dementia. Now, hopefully that's clear. Well, thank you both very much for a wonderful presentation, and thank you guys all for coming, both here and in Kurtzville. And this has come to the conclusion of this year's lecture. Thank you all.